Hymn book, Gospel Hymns and Songs, number 46. A Christian home, oh, give us home, build farm upon the Savior, where Christ is head and counselor and guide. Where every child is taught his love and favor, and give his heart to Christ the crucified. How sweet to know that though his footsteps waver, his faithful Lord is walking by his side. Oh, give us homes with godly fathers, mothers who always place their hope and trust in him, whose tender patience. To all ever brothers, whose calm and courage trouble cannot deem. A home where it finds joy in serving others and lost it shines, though they be dark and grim. O oh, give our homes where Christ is Lord and Master. The Bible read the precious MC song where prayer comes first in peace or in disaster and praise is natural speech to every tongue. Where mountains move before a faith as pastor, and Christ's sufficient is for old and young. O oh Lord our God, our homes are dying forever. We trust to thee their problems, toil and care. Their bonds of love no enemy can sever. If thou art always Lord and master there, be thou the center of our least endeavor. Be thou our guests, our hearts, our homes to share.
In Jesus' name, we pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this blessed morning. Thank you for the day you have made. We commit this morning, search the scripture to your hands. We pray that you speak to our hearts and grant us the grace to be the doers of your word so that our homes can be heaven here on earth. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, I pray. Today we are learning about love and submission in the home. Can we all say that together? A memory verse will be in First Peter chapter three, verses five and six. Can we get a volunteer to recite a memory verse? Yeah, our brother here. Our memory verse is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, being in subjection unto their own husbands. 
For after this manner in the old time, the holy women who trusted in God. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, being in subjection unto their old husband, are done themselves. Thank you very much for the trial. Can we all recite together? First Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, after the count of 2, 1, 2, read. Thank you. We want a fast reader to help us with our test. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Yes, our brother. First Peter chapter 3 from verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be warned by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God, Adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Thank you very much. Like I've said, we are considering this morning love and submission in the home. The command of God for both husband and wife in the home is to demonstrate love and submission amidst others. Christians must know that their experience of the new birth affects every area of their lives. Love and submission remain the effort for stability and progress in the home and also serves as a sure panacea for the survival of homes and family. If our home will stand as the Lord expects today, these two ingredients of love and submission must be seen vividly in our homes. The home is where the true holiness between husband and wife will be manifested with a ripple effect of winning over the ungodly partner, children, and the unconverted neighbors. Apostle Peter also admonished believing women to avoid worldly adornment and to embrace sobriety in disposition to submit to their husbands where this twin pillar of love from husband to their wives as to Christ is being demonstrated and submission of wives to their husbands as sincerely obeyed, our homes will indeed be heaven of righteousness, abode of peace, joy, comfort, rest, respect, fellowship, and fruitfulness. Question number one, what are God's commands for husband and wife in the home? Yes, my brother there. The wife should submit to their own husband, while the husband should love their wives as Christ also loved the church. Thank you very much. That takes us to three subheading in our lesson this morning. We look at point number one, need for submission in the Christian home. Need for submission in the Christian home. 
Submission to God's will and commandments is the hallmark of our Christian devotion. Tell me of someone that can submit in the home. Then I will tell you of someone who has submitted to God the Supreme. It will not be difficult for anyone to submit in the home, outside the home, if actually he has met the Lord at the point of conversion. If his life has been transformed, he can submit without any argument. It is the desire of the Lord that marriage institution be kept sacred, nurtured in the fear and admonition of God following his command. What are the commands? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, verse 22, 24 and 25. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Here you see that the command has been given that wives should submit to their own husband in comparison to that of Christ, how he gave his life even to the death on the cross of Calvary. Submission of wives to their own husband means submitting to God. Number two, it means submitting to the will of God. And it also means that you are submitting to the headship of Christ and the finally appointed authorities, that is, those that have rule over them. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 and verse 23, And whatsoever ye do in words, in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, and the Father by him. Verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it utterly, as to the Lord, and not unto men. I pray that the Lord will help us to obey this injunction in Jesus' name. And with this understanding by the wives to guide them, it will not be difficult to submit themselves to the headship of their husband. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I read verses 1 and 2 of our text. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. Why they behold your chaste, your modest, you know, conversation coupled with fear. We see here that godly women should emulate Sarah, as you see it in verse 6 of our text, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. If Wives cannot obey at home. Any kind of obedience outside the home is irrelevant in the sight of God. Obedience actually starts from home. And when that is demonstrated, you can be sure that either outside the home, in the place of work, that kind of obedience will be acceptable before the law. Christian women should reverence and honor their husbands irrespective of their status in the society to bring about peace progress in the family question number two mention some benefits of obeying god's command in the home can we have an answer from this side mention some benefits of obeying god's command in the home well when there is obedience to the word of god in the home it makes the unbelieving husband to be converted and the people around 
it will, make, it will bring salvation to those that are seen us living as Christians. Thank you very much. That takes us to point number two. Nuggets of biblical adornment and sobriety. Nuggets of biblical adornment and sobriety. We go back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 3. We read verses 3 and 4. Who's adorning? Let it not be the out, that outward adorning of plating the air and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the eating man of the earth, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price the adorning of the woman professing godliness should be moderate should be simple and not to be extravagant or flamboyant it should be devoid of all form of worldly ornaments in fact it should be a reflection of outward and inward disposition of sobriety of meekness and of a quiet spirit in first timothy chapter 2 i read verses 9 and 10 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair or gold or pears or costly array but which become women professing godliness with good works. Women need to remember and know that what secures the love of a husband is not the cosmetic, but good character and godly disposition, a beautiful inner life that is decorated with quietness, that is filled with sobriety and radiance as well as peace and that is the real beauty that does not fade away with age and is not of great value in the sight of god the real beauty of the christian is the inner man the holiness that shines through him or her and not the costly array it's not the costly adornment or the, you know, the worldly air court or calling, blowing air that show the depravity of the heart. Neither is it golden wristwatches, headbands, chains, and earrings, and other deviations that help to inflame pride and vanity. A believer can do without makeup and yet appear neat presentable, attractive, and winsome to the spouse. On the other hand, shabby and repulsive outward appearance will not glorify God either. Remember that the purpose of putting on clothes is to cover our nakedness, is to glorify God. It says in Isaiah 43, verse 21, These people have I formed for myself. They will show forth my praise. In everything we do, in our dressing, in our talk, in our love, in our submission, we should show forth the praise of the Almighty God. Question number three. What is the dress code of a godly woman? Can we get an answer from this side? What is the dress code of a godly woman? Yes, any hands up? Yes. The dress code of a Christian woman is the inner beauty and holiness, not the outward appearance. Although the Christian woman should also keep her safe need, but the inner beauty of holiness is the one that the Bible commands us. Thank you very much. That takes us to point number three. Necessity of love and consideration by the husband. Necessity of love and consideration by the husband. 
God commands us to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our body, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, he gave a specific command to husbands to love their own wives and dwell with them according to knowledge. If you see that in First Peter chapter 3, in verse 7, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. The weaker vessel there is not talking about the understanding or knowledge. You find women in different fields today. And so it's not talking about that. As being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not in that. True love radiates. True love makes us to think of the future and the purpose for which we exist in the family. Love is not easily provoked, but forgives when offenses arise. As a husband and wife live together, there will be time, maybe there will be one problem or the other. But where their love is, the Bible says, love covers multitude of sin, the shortcoming, the thing that will have been just overlooked. Where love is, it will cover that. Love is not easily prov provoked, but forgives. Re-sanctification experience is a must for such a desirous possibility in the home without purity of heart we cannot hope to see god after our stay on earth hebrews chapter 12 in verse 14 follow peace with all men all men difficult men follow peace with them soft men follow peace with them follow peace with all men and that peace should be coupled with holiness without which no man so i see the lord when christian husbands possess this indispensable experience they will certainly love their wife they will cherish their wife they will follow peace and holiness with their wives despite their shortcomings question number four how can the husband show love to the wife in the home can we get from the choir stand how can the husband show love to the wife Husband can show love by accepting the wife, even though she made me sick, and as well pray for her in anything that feel not at home that he's doing. Thank you very much. The husband should be considerate and loving. Husband must cherish and nourish their wives. Husband must protect and pray for his wife, as Christ does for the church. The husband must not be bitter against his wife, nor dishonor her, as it leads to delay in prayer. Question number five, why should a godly husband love and honor his wife? Yes, any hand from here? Yes, my sister. He should love the wife so that his prayer will not be hindered. Thank you very much. Despite many causes of conflict and challenges in the home, like failure to live and clean, you cannot say you are married and you are still staying with your parents. That is wrong. Where there is delay in childbearing, that's part of the conflict or problem that may occur. Despite all of these, Obedience to God's word and presence of Christ in the home solves all problems and helps the family to overcome them. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another 
with a pure heart how fervently what are the lessons we have learned this morning we've learned that one love and submission are key to a happy family we learned also that Christ must be the head the counselor the guide for real submission and love to take place number three we are to give more attention to the beauty of the inner man number four obedience to God's war solves all problems the presence of God in the home helps the family to overcome challenges and problems where love and submission are obeyed and practiced in the home children give their heart to Christ early in life if we practice it if we are doers of it our homes will be heaven here on earth our home will show forth the praise and the glory of God wherein where there is love and submission in the home that is done as Christ has done it I tell you that it will rub off on the children it will rub off on the neighborhood it will rub off on the church and at large our community and the world also there's going to be peace and progress in the family and husband and wife will live together in fact our home will be indeed heaven of righteousness peace joy comfort rest respect and fellowship and fruitfulness may God make us to be doers of his word. let's open close our eyes as we go to the Lord in prayer Lord has given us the command to love as husband and to submit as wife and for this to be a reality you must have visited Calvary how is your home is Christ the Lord and Savior there is there love is there respect are children seeing those godly example from daddy from mommy are they hoping someday to have a godly home like this when there are problems and conflict trust the Lord as you repent of all those negligence of the past and you receive the grace of God at Calvary this morning and you ask the Lord to help make my home a godly home and as we have sang this morning oh give us who build upon the Savior what a prayer tell the Lord make my home a kind of the one you want it to be in Jesus name we pray I only father we thank you for your word you've reminded us of this morning how we pray that Lord you will be the guide of every home and you help us as husbands to love our wives as you have done it and as wives to submit to the husband I pray that our homes will be a kind that will glorify the Lord thank you because we know you've answered where there are problems and challenges as we trust you we pray Lord you will clear them off in Jesus name thank you for answering our prayers in Jesus name I pray and everybody said yeah. as we have studied this morning and I studied the scripture on love and submission in the home we have question time now and the question is why should there be love and submission in the home another question is if we're going to build a strong home a happy home a loving home a home that produces children that will be on top of their world what are the elements and who are the people that will build such a home the question is for such a home profitable happy forward-looking progressive and for such a home where every member the wife the husband 
the children where every member is fulfilled and happy and none could wish for a better home this is the home i would like to spend the whole of my life who are the people and what are the elements that build such a home those are the questions we're looking at today the elements the parts the components the people that build a happy home a godly home a fulfilled fulfilling home a progressive home a home where everybody wants to abide the three of the elements we're looking at number one the heart number two the head number three the hands number one the heart the heart is the homemaker the heart is the wife and it's the heart that must be in a good condition so that the contribution of that heart to the home will make it a pleasant home to live in a loving lovely home first peter chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 4 first peter chapter 3 verse 4 but let it be the healing man of the heart it's talking about the wife after he has spoken about do this do this don't let it be this let it be this and then he gives us an example an example from the old testament of the family of abraham and sarah now he mentions in the middle of that whole passage the hidden man of the heart telling us then the importance of the wife at home and that the wife should act should be placed centrally as the heart if you consider a man any man any person you will see that the heart is very important the feet may be sound and strong the hands may be strong and active the eyesight may be good and vigilant and the tongue may speak well if something is wrong with the heart the whole body is gone and so if the homemaker if the wife is to be the heart that heart that wife that homemaker must be healthy that homemaker must be who she ought to be and when you think of yourself every time as the heart you understand what the heart does the heart is the seat of love that's where that's the fountain of love and when you understand the heart in a person is the one pumping out blood to every part of the body and the wife as the homemaker the wife as the heart is the one that is flowing love to every part of the body the husband receives his portion the wife the children receive their portion and if there is any loss of the flow of the blood to the rest of the body you know that everything was shut down the same thing with the wife the heart of the family and the heart of the home if there is a break if there is a cessation if there is a stopping of that love that ought to flow from the heart to every part of the body whatever the family has whatever the family may possess there is something wrong with that body with that family the heart is a seat of forgiveness and the nature of the wife because she's a help me she knows i must have this heart i am the heart 
I must be loving every time and the forgiveness must flow out every time because when that stops again you look at the heart of a person that forgiveness has now stopped it's like i'm offended it's like this family cannot go on it's like i'm at enmity to everybody and then the heart is waiting for the husband to come for the children to come until they beg i'm not going to forgive think about yourself again as the heart it's like the heart is stopping every legitimate function and until the hand will come and plead and the feet will come and plead the heart will not send forth the blood to every part of the body but you understand it's a cycle it is when the blood flows to every part even to the brain to the head to the hands to every part that's how the hands and the feet and every part will be able to do their part and so you understand how central the wife is she is the seat of love and the seat of forgiveness the heart is the seat of compassion of mercy and the lord has so constituted and created the wife that she'll be merciful she'll be compassionate she'll be caring and if you go along with that constitution and creation the family will be what it ought to be it's the seat of care and it's the seat of cooperation actually it is the heart that uh, kind of cooperates with every part and giving every part what every part ought to have and it is how every part will be strong every part will be agile every part will be active and the heart is a seat of intimacy the heart is the seat of intimacy is the wife that makes allowance for that intimacy my husband is not a talking my husband is not relating well understand your position don't wait you are the one at the very spring and foundation and fountain of that intimacy remember once again the wife is the heart of the family and as we look at the scriptures i'm coming to songs of solomon and in songs of solomon i'm reading from chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 6 songs of solomon chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 6 it tells us in verse 6 still about the heart which is the seat of love which is the seat of compassion and the seat of forgiveness it says in the songs of solomon chapter 8 verse 6 set me as a seal upon thine heart there's the heart talking to the heart there's the deep expressing her desire to the heart of the husband and it says set me as a seal upon thine heart as a seal upon thine arm for love is as strong as this love is as strong as death if you allow the vitality of the love the originality of the love and the spring of love to keep on flowing and you know that anything that happens either from the husband or from the children or from the in-laws or from money issues that will stop the love wants to stop your function as the heart and you say no that must not happen because you understand you are the heart of the home and that you are strong as death jealousy is cruel as the grave and the coals thereof are coals of fire it's talking about fervent love it's talking about a passion 
that wants to be everything and do everything for the family. It says it has the most vehement flame. The New Testament puts it in a very clear, directive way. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love, unpretending love. You have given yourself to a kind of love that is not superficial. It's a love that is transparent. We can see through. It's a love that is felt. It's a love that is recognized. It's a love that is perfect. It's a love that is passionate. It says that you see that you love one another this is a general, um, a general verse for everyone, but we're applying it to the family now with a pure heart fervently. The heart is very central, and the heart is very important as we think of the wife. And the heart of the husband is affected by the heart of the family. In Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs chapter 31, I read here from verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For a price is above rubies. Look at the next verse. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. The heart of the homemaker, the heart of the wife, does her function very well. The husband receives that, and the husband rests on that. It affects his own heart too. It affects his own disposition too. It affects his confidence in that wife too. And the heart of the husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil look at verse 12 she the heart will do him good and not evil all the days of her life come back to a person having a heart he has a good heart he has a heart that is sending blood to every part of the body. He has a heart that will not fail. He has a, a heart that is immune to attack. There's no heart attack. And it's not slumping. It's not a falling down suddenly. She's always active and always positive, always practical. And because of that, the husband is not suspecting maybe today things are not going to be good. He knows that the heart of the home is always what it ought to be. And therefore the heart of the husband safely trusts in her. And he knows she will not do, do me evil. She will do me good all the days of my life now. When the heart is all right, when the heart is healthy and strong, other parts of the body too, they'll be healthy, they'll be sound, they'll be strong, and the head would also have been a share of the blood being pumped from the heart. The head too will be all right. In our local language, the head will be correct. And nobody will say the head of that family is not correct. The head is proper. The head is correct. And the head is dutiful. That brings me to the second person as a builder of the home. 
as a lifter up of the home, the head of the home, the headship of the husband. The husband is the head. Look at this. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. For the husband is the head over the heart. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. He is the savior of the body. What does that mean? Let's say a person is going on the road. A car is coming. And he might be crushed if it were not for the head. That's where the eyes are, is a, a kind of uh, place. That's where the ears are also established. That's where instruction the head of instru the, the instruction for the whole body is centered in the head as the heart has sent the blood to every part of the body and to the head look at this car coming is the head with the connections of the brain and the all the electrons and everything there that will quickly send a message to the eyes look at your car that's the head, that's not the heart. And then to hear the sound of the horn that a car is coming, and to hear the sound of that car is the head, not the heart. And to quickly give instruction to the feet to move and to run or to step back is the head, not the heart. And so the head is the one that directs. That's what it means when it says the husband is the head of the wife of the home. He gives direction. It's the head that thinks. It is the deposit area of thoughts, of thinking. And when you have a thinking head, a directing head, you have a planning head. It's the head that plans. It's the head that leads and says, you can move now. Danger is over. Get up and move. Or stay. Don't go yet. Another car is coming. It's the head that gives direction. It's the head that leads. It's the head that rules. The ruling is guiding. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. And I read from verse 16. Genesis chapter 3. We're reading from verse 16. In verse 16, talking about the head, talking about the osman. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. You understand? Some people are for either Old Testament or New Testament. And they never think of the things that are general. The things that supersede Old Covenant or New Covenant. This verse cuts across Old Testament and New Testament because the women in conception still are pain in childbearing. And now it says, Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. The ruling there is not the ruling of a tyrant. It's not the ruling of an oppressor. It's the ruling of a guide, of a director, of a manager. 
the one that shows the way and guides the family and coordinates the efforts of the family and tells the family where we ought to go. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm reading here from verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. It's talking about the headship of the family, and it says the head of the, uh, of the wife, of the woman, is Christ. Sorry, the head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. Look at verse 5. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, her own normal, natural head, dishonors her head, dishonors her husband. It's like somebody is not under submission, for that is even all as if she was shaven. Verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. The wife is the glory of the husband. And this head, as we have noticed in the word of God, is not a tyrannical head. It's a loving head to you. Come back to Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The head is giving. He gives instruction. He gives enlightenment. He gives uh, wisdom. And he gives also material things that the family needs so that the family will live comfortably. Look at verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. How about that? He that loveth his wife loveth his wife. Remember now, the husband is the head, and the wife the heart. And when the head, the head loves the heart, the heart is excited, happy, and the heart is a kind of enthusiastic in doing what she ought to do. And she sends the blood, and she sends the love, and she sends the compassion, and she sends the mercy all across the whole family, even to the children. And so when the head makes the heart happy, and makes the heart fulfilled. The heart will reciprocate to the head and to the whole of the body. For no man, in verse 29, ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause, Shall a man leave his father and mother is mature enough to live alone? For this cause shall the husband leave his father and mother. He's not running back home for every little problem that happens in his own family with his wife. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they, and they too shall be one flesh. No divorce. Amen. 
no separation amen no turning backs against each other amen this is a great mystery but i speak concerning christ and the church nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence she honor and she respect her husband the heart that's the wife the head that's the husband the hands now husband and wife do not stay indoor every day all the day they must supply the needs of the family and so if the family is going to be happy going to be fulfilled and going to be prospered they must understand on both sides they are hands to work and provide for the family. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands. Husband. Let him labor walking with his sons. The sin that is good that she may have to give to him that needeth. He must be able to supply the needs of the wife and the needs of the family, the needs of the children. In Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1 every wise woman buildeth her house every wise woman wife buildeth a house but the foolish is talking about the wife the foolish plucketh it down with her hands you want a good family it's not just that i love i produce intimacy and when you bring everything home i can cook it and provide for the family you also use your hands to build up your family as a wife god will help all of us proverbs chapter 31 Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 and 19. In verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For a price is above rubies. Verse 19, she lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. You see, why? With the heart, you understand, I supply. I supply like the heart pumps the blood all through the body. I also supply. I also give. And I'm not waiting that the man only will be the breadwinner. If there is anything I can do with my hand, I will do it for the provision of the family and I will make available every sin that I gather together for the progress and for the strength of the family in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 whatsoever thy hand findest to do we must be resourceful. We must be imaginative. We must strategize. And we must look ahead and look around. What can I do for the provision of the family, both the man and the woman? 
I'm a graduate, I cannot find office work, find something. Your hand must not be idle. To build up a family, we need the heart, we need the head, we need the hands. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy mind. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. First Thessalonians chapter 4. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. And that she study, endeavor, try, be diligent, to be quiet, and to do your own business, husband and wife, to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, do something, and work with your hands, and provide for the family. Your family will be prospered in jesus name our families will stand strong our families will stand competent our families will stand totally provided for in jesus name second thessalonians chapter three i'm reading from verse seven Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 7 For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught Don't allow your wife to be begging in the community Don't allow your children to be begging in the community use your hands and provide for the family but we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you not be not because we have not power but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us for even when we were, we, we were with you for even when we were there with you this we commanded commanded you that if any would not work neither should he eat we will work husbands we will work wives we will work everyone in the family you will do something to provide for the livelihood of the family for we hear in verse 11 that there are some which walk among you disorderly walking not at all but are busy bodies now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread and as you eat that bread and drink that water the lord will bless your bread the lord will bless your water and the lord will take sickness and infirmity out of the midst of your family in jesus name to round it up everyone in the family must manifest love the wife the husband the children the parents everyone in first corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels. You're a member of the church, a minister in the church, you're active, and you speak the doctrine effectively, and you teach the word effectively, and you speak the language of theology, and you speak the language of 
angelic spirituality and have not charity, have not love. There's no love in the family. We rush out of the family. Have an assignment, have a duty. We neglect our wives and neglect our, our children. We neglect our husbands. I'm going for duty. If you have not love in the family, you have become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Do I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? You take your time, you're reading the Bible all the time, and you're getting to the mysteries of the kingdom of God all the time. There's no time to love the husband. There's no time to love the wife. I must understand the depths of revelation in the Bible. Look at this. Even if you are that, and though I have all fears so that I can, I can remove mountains. And the, you know, maybe the husband, I'm fasting today. And when I'm fasting, I don't want to see anybody's face. And then tomorrow I'm fasting. And the next day I'm fasting, I must have power. I must move mountains. The power to move mountains. And when the husband finishes his own marathon fasting, then the wife begins her own. I'm fasting today too. As a wife, I must work miracles. As a wife, I must move mountains. You are fasting all the time, and the fasting is drawing you far and far apart. Even though you fast and you have all the faith, so you can remove mountains and have not love. I am nothing. Whatever you do in the family, spiritual things, church matters. Whatever takes you away from the family, I'm always there. I'm always there. And you know, people are calling me, they need counseling. People are calling me, they need advice. And people are calling me, they need directives. But your wife doesn't have your attention. Your husband doesn't have your attention. It says, even if you did all that, and there's no love in the family, there's no intimacy in the family, you are nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I'm philanthropic. And yet, my children are dying of hunger. They're dying of need. They don't have new clothes. My wife does not have new clothes. The husband does not have new clothes. We're giving out everything. It's a generous man. It's a generous woman. Don't mind him. Don't mind her. The wife is dying. The husband is dying of hunger and need. And yet, he gives all his good to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burnt, and have not love, have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long. How long is long? Longer than the end of each day. Charity suffers long. It's because uh, so-called so Christian men and women, they cannot suffer long, longer than the end of today. That's why they retaliate. That's why they fight back. That's why they go to the court. That's why they separate. That's why they divorce. But charity love suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself. Hey, woman, sit down. I'm a graduate. Man, find your place. I'm more educated than you are. Head of the home, head of the home, head of the home. And yet, you understand, I have higher certificate than you have. But you know, my sister, you know, my brother, charity, love, vaunteth not itself. It's not popped up, does not behave itself unseemly, unkindly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. There are houses, there are homes where anger is more pronounced than love but it's not easily provoked thinketh no evil rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth bears all things somebody give me a good amen, amen. you bear you submit 
you control yourself you don't say i can't take it any longer that's a statement that says my love is finished my love is run out grace is no more available i can't stand it any longer love beareth all things believeth all things hopeth all things tell me the rest there you know i want to hear a good voice there endureth all things verse eight love never faileth love will not fail in your family love will not cease in your family love will produce every good thing that will keep your family alive and active and happy and fulfilled well provided for in jesus name the heart what is the heart of the family can i see you raise up your hand the heart the heart i'm looking for them the heart what will make you a healthy heart the head where is the head in the family where are you the lord will make you a competent capable providing head in jesus name the hands in the family where are the hands in the family the lord will bless those hands if you are jobless the lord will provide if there's anything that is making your hand inactive inoperative the lord will take every attack and every affliction away in jesus name abundance for your family surplus for your family power in your family provision in your family a new lease of life in your family in jesus name rise up and talk to the lord lord make me the heart i ought to be make me the head i ought to be and make me the physical and the spiritual and the progressive and the providing hands i ought to be open your mouth and let the lord bless you
up as we sing together from our hymn book number 84 gospel hymns and songs number 84 deeper deeper in the love of jesus deeper deeper in the love of jesus daily let me go higher higher in the school of wisdom more of grace to know deeper deeper blessed holy spirit Take me deeper still, till my life is wholly lost in Jesus and his perfect will. Deeper, deeper, though he cause her trials, deeper let me go. Rooted in the holy love of Jesus, let me fruitful grow. Deeper, higher every day in Jesus, till all conflict pass, find me conquer and his own image perfected at last. O oh, deeper yet I pray, a higher every day, and wise and blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word.
Christian law, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comforts, and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual bodies there, and often for each other flow. The sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again.
want to remain standing as we go to the Lord in prayer. We want to thank the Lord this morning for the depth of the word of God the Lord has taken us to this morning. Let's thank the Lord this morning. The depth and the deeper that the Lord has taken us to this morning. In respect of our homes, let's thank the Lord and bless the name of the Lord. And pray all the blessing pronounced all those prophetic statements of the man of God will be fulfilled in our families. Open your mouth and tell the Lord this morning all those blessings pronounced upon our families will be fulfilled. And pray for the grace of God this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We have been told that our roles, functions, our responsibilities, and the place God has put us in the family. Let's ask for the grace of God to fulfill what the Lord has put us in the family. Open your mouth and pray. Tell the Lord this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. It's now time to give our tithes and offering to the Lord. Whatsoever you have brought to offer unto the Lord this morning, can we raise it up as we pray together? Father, we are grateful unto you for your blessing upon our life this morning. And out of the abundance we are giving to all, we are giving this as our love unto you. We pray that this morning our offering will be acceptable in your sight in Jesus' name. And as long as we live, our life and resources all will be dedicated to your glory in Jesus' name. Pray you will bless us in return. Jesus' name we pray. Our leaders are there passing the bags around. We are to put in what we have brought unto the Lord. Why we remain in the mood of prayer. Now I want to pray for the church. We want to thank God for the vision the Lord has given to the church. And we are going to pray that as the church is reaching out in evangelism, multitude will be brought to the kingdom. Multitude will be brought to the kingdom. Open your mouth and tell the Lord. As we are reaching out this month, multitude of souls will be brought unto the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to pray for our pastor. And we are going to pray that as the Lord is opening his eyes to greater visions, the anointing will increase in his life. The power of God will increase in his life. And all that the Lord wants him to do for this generation, he will fulfill in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to pray for our nation that the peace of God will rule in our nation. All this kidnapping, insecurity, the Lord will put an end to it. 
and that the Lord will lead the government to direct the nation in the right path. That righteousness will reign in our nation. Open your mouth and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. As we are here this morning, God has started on with blessing. That the blessing will continue. And the man of God come forward again. More blessing will be poured upon our life. More blessing will be poured upon our family. Open your mouth and tell the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we are grateful unto you this morning. We thank you for the way you have blessed us abundantly. And we believe you have more in store for our life this morning. Lord, we pray you accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Lord, you are leading the church on in bringing multitude to the kingdom. Father, we pray every one of us, you will use us to bring multitude to your kingdom in Jesus' name. And Lord, this morning, you will visit us the more. You will visit our family the more. All the pronouncements the pastor has made for our family this morning, they will remain in Jesus' name. This month, we will celebrate. In our family, we will celebrate. In our church, we will celebrate. We thank you because you have answered. Jesus' name, I pray. We are welcome to the service this morning in Jesus' name. I say we are welcome to this service this morning in Jesus' name. This is the combined service of Group 2 Old District. And it's our pleasure to welcome those who are worshiping with us for the very first time today. So, if today is your first time of fellowshipping with us, we kindly request you to raise up your hand wherever you are for identification of our pastor's greeting. You are there, you are coming for the first time. Kindly raise up your hand where you are for identification. You are welcome in Jesus' name. Our pastor, the jazz pretending, and the entire church are happy that you are here today. And the Lord that has brought you will bless you abundantly. The pastor will want me to welcome you specially and encourage you to keep coming. That as the Lord is using him to bless us, he will be used to bless you and your family in Jesus' name. Our ushers are standing by you. They will give you a sleep to, come, to fill. Please complete the sleep and return the sleep to them. As you do so, may the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Weekly meetings. We have three important meetings in the week in our church. Sunday like this is a day of worshiping the Lord in truth and in spirit. And we start by 8 a.m. Mondays is the day of a systematic study of the Word of God. Monday Bible study. And it's our Bible school. And it's a been of great blessing to our life. The time of our meeting on Monday is 6 p.m. On Thursdays is a day of revival. Thursday Miracle Revival and Evangelism Training Service. It's a day in which our life is revived and the time of our meeting is 6.30 p.m. The brethren that brought you will direct you to the nearest district church or location to you. And as you come along with us, the Lord will do you good in Jesus' name. 
I said the Lord will do you good in Jesus name Be our 
the places my hope for you is love and peace with Christ the The faces and beat and feast on the pages. I hope filled with love and peace. When Jesus Christ is King, give us a hope, hope sweet hope. Let there be love shed upon us. Let there be love in our hearts. May now you love be the family. Before the Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. Chapter 17 These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, 
and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Chapter 18 When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, 
for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them, and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber.
glorious family.
Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the worship service. Thank you for the ministries of all those who have ministered to us from the beginning of the service, from the children to the youth to the adults. We're asking, Lord, you bless their ministry to our souls in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that every blessing you have for us today, none of us will miss your blessing. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now we're coming to First Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 4. First Peter chapter 3. We're reading from verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of god is of great price as we look at verses one through to seven we'll see that the lord is talking to the family through the pain inspired pain of the apostle peter god instituted marriage god created man and the woman and god ordained drug of inward beauty building our homes on the bedrock on the solid foundation of inward beauty there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the inner beauty of a virtuous wife. A virtuous wife is beautiful. But the beauty is from inside. And then it comes to the outside. The inner beauty of a virtuous wife. Point number two, the internal backbone of a vibrant husband, a husband that is not weak, a husband with a backbone, a husband whose internal backbone is vibrant and healthy and supportive. Point number three, the inside bank of a visionary home. There's a kind of bank that we have on the inside and when we have any need we can draw out of that bank and meet the need of the family the inside bank of a visionary home point number one the inner beauty of a virtuous wife as we're saved by the grace of god we are cleansed by Christ, we are sanctified as a Christian, a definite Christian experience. The woman becomes a virtuous lady, a virtuous wife, a virtuous mother, a virtuous homemaker. And the apostle by the Spirit is pointing out to us what a virtuous wife will possess that makes her beautiful number one a winsome character a winsome character the beauty that reflects from the inside makes her beautiful and winsome look at verses one and two of um, first peter chapter 3 likewise she wise be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may without the word be won by the conversation by the lifestyle by the character of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation 
while they behold your attractive lifestyle coupled with fear, coupled with reverence. You see, men might be difficult, a husband might be difficult, an unbelieving husband might be difficult, and yet God has enough grace for the winsome wife, for the character of a virtuous woman to draw that husband to Christ and to herself. It's saying that a virtuous woman, a virtuous wife, who is beautiful from the out, from the inside, will not drive the husband away. Although the husband might seem tough and tyrannical, yet the character, winsome character, beautiful character, loving character, submissive character, instead of driving the man away, will draw the man to Christ. And not only drawing him to Christ, will draw him to that wife. Such a wonderful character we find in Romans chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are stronger, it's talking about being strong by grace. It's talking about the wife now in the context of what we're reading, that you are strong because of the grace of God. You see heaven ahead because of the grace of God. And you have got something that makes you strong in conviction, strong in character, by the grace of God. But your husband has not seen that, has not known that. And it says the very first thing you are going to manifest, you are going to manifest that strength and you bear the infirmities of your weak husband. And not to please ourselves, let every one of us please his neighbor. In particular, now let every wife please her husband for his good to edification. He might think that you are so submissive because now you have gone to church. He might think you're sheepish because you have gone to church. He might think that now your humble and your humility now he can ride on you because of what he sees you're doing it for a purpose and your character with some character is going to make him think and say this woman was not like this before the christ who has made a change in this woman will make a change in me it will happen Verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Christ, your Lord and Master, please not himself. So don't think that in your family you're going to give it to the husband and please yourself and bring him down and run him down. After all, he's not a good husband. You will have a winsome character. We're coming back to First Peter chapter 3. Number 2, the second mark of a winsome wife, a virtuous wife, is a compatible outward cleanliness. Compatible outward cleanliness look at verse 3 first peter chapter 3 verse 3 who's adorning let it not be that outward adorning or plating the air of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel when it says or putting on of apparel, you understand? It's not saying that you will not dress yourself. It's not saying you will not have a pleasing appearance. It's talking about moderation here. And it says, not gold. That one is definite for the Christian wife. And it's not adorned by 
the air style of the people of the world that one is clear for a child of God as you read the whole of the New Testament but he's saying you'll still be presentable I'm reading from Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband adorned for her husband is the same Bible is saying that you still have good outward appearance that will still be clear and nice and presentable before your husband you are adorned for your husband not for the world if it were for the world you'll dress to please the world you'll put on this and put on that to please the world but you will please your husband you will not dress shabbily you will not appear deliberately ugly and deliberately unkempt you'll have compatible outward cleanliness number three we're coming back to first peter chapter three and i'm reading from verse four a meek and quiet spirit he's saying this is what makes the wife beautiful this is what makes the wife acceptable to the husband and the husband would always think i don't think i can ever find a better wife than this my present wife i don't think i can ever find a more compatible wife more than this my present wife look at what makes her virtuous what makes her winsome i'm looking at verse 4 first peter chapter 3 verse 4 but let it be the hidden man of the heart is saying that as you take care of your outside appearance outward appearance and you are presentable to your husband look at the inward aspect as well and make sure that if this on the outside outward will please my husband if i can make the effort and if i can do it and make myself beautiful to my husband I can do it on the inside too. I can have the grace of God too. I can have the favor of God too and have a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Look at chapter 3 verse 15. Verse 15 of 1 Peter. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Every time take care of the heart. Your heart, your spirit can betray you. If somebody is angry in the heart, it will ooze out. Your heart will betray you on your face. If somebody is difficult, difficult to live with, difficult to interact with, if it's there in the heart, it will show in the action. It will show that she wants to start a fight she wants to start a conflict she wants the husband to see this and hear this and react so that there can be a fight a virtuous wife will not do that you'll carry in your bosom meekness gentleness as well as a quiet spirit Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. That's applicable to everybody, in particular to the wife. We come to number four, you have a trusting disposition a trusting disposition there might be a problem you are not going to say immediately there's a problem that's what i'm saying 
things should not be like this if you were paying all the bills if you were doing your assignment if you were doing everything you ought to do in the family will not have this kind of a mayhem and this kind of conflict in the family you have a trusting disposition look at verse 5 for after this manner in old time holy women also trusted in god trusted in god any challenge trust in god any problem trust in god we're still waiting to have children trust in god it appears that enough money is not coming in trust in god it appears that things are difficult now in particular for us in our nucleus family in our, in our family trust in god holy women you believe in holiness then trust in god you profess to be sanctified and trust in god it is that trust in god that will never complain it is that trust in god that will not murmur it is that trust in god that will not look down on your husband when things are hard and when things are difficult you'll not allow your own parents to stir you up against your husband just because things are difficult what is difficult today will become easy tomorrow this country we see today will become you'll have surplus tomorrow a trusting disposition let's look at hebrews chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 11 hebrews chapter 11 verse 11 through faith also sarah herself received strength to conceive seed if anyone is barren here, barrenness will go away. We don't get children by fighting one another in the family. If there's a delay of a particular blessing in the family, the blessing will not come by fighting, by conflict. Look at Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah was not accusing Abraham you are the cause of the barrenness. You are an old man. And look at you now who is going to have a child through you. When you talk to your husband, understand you are the angel in the home. Speak like an angel and speak like a virtuous woman. Whatever the problem may be, watch this uh, Egyptians that you see today. You will not see them tomorrow in Jesus' name. She received strength herself to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. The Lord has promised us you will not lack. And everything your family lacks, the Lord will supply in Jesus' name. Number five is submissive conduct. Is submissive conduct. We're coming back to First Peter chapter three, and I'm reading from the second part of verse five. Who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah. Page Abraham calling him Lord and that word calling is in the continuous tense it's not that you know in the Greek language in the which in which the New Testament was written there are some actions some verbs they take place once and for all full stop others took place in the past and no more but there are some tenses in the greek that the way it's constructed is happening and happening and happening in the day it's going on in the night it's going on 
when the weather is cool, that action is going on. When the weather is hot, that, that uh, action is going on. That's what he's saying here. You have a submissive conduct morning, afternoon, and night. When things, when there's heat, when there's cold, when you are not happy, now understand, there may be something that happens that makes you unhappy. You're a human being. But being unhappy doesn't mean being unholy. We can retain our holiness even when it appears we're unhappy about something. Calling him Lord. You retain the good language. You retain the good name. You retain the good title. You call him. You don't change your language. Language of honor. Language of respect. Language of submission. And the language that you used when you were happy. You continue with that language. Calling him Lord. Number six, irrespective tongue. Irrespecting a tongue. A tongue in the language of her mouth. The husband, the wife talking to the husband. The wife talking about the husband. The wife talking before the husband, behind the husband, a language of respect. Look at verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye are, ye do well and are not afraid of any amazement. Afraid of any amazement. Proverbs chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4. Proverbs chapter 12. Let's read from verse 4. It says in verse 4, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She knows how to talk. She knows what to say. And she knows how to quench the fire and to put off the fire by the words of her mouth. Look at the opposite in Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 4. I've read to you Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. Look at the other side. In Psalm 12, verse 4. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord over us. There are people that speak in such a way as to tear the whole house down. They speak and the words are piercing and the words seem to say, I'm a woman of myself. I'm a woman of my own idea. I speak and let what will be, be. Whatever will happen, let it happen. A person who wants to build a home, a good home, a loving home does not act like that, does not behave like that. But she speaks with the words that will meant, not the words that will mar. In Proverbs chapter 15, reading from verse 1, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, is soft answer. Turneth away wrath. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. You use your tongue as a repairing tool. You use your tongue as a beautiful tattoo 
truths that will help the family to move forward and then it says in verse 3 the eyes of the lord are in every place behold in the evil and the good a wholesome tongue is a tree of life that's what the tongue of a virtuous wife will be in a family number one a winsome character number two a compatible outward cleanliness number three a meek and quiet spirit number four a trusting disposition number five a submissive conduct number six a respectful tongue number seven a helpful support helpful support look at first peter first peter chapter three i'm reading from verse seven first peter chapter three we're reading from verse seven it's talking about the husband and he makes allusion to the wife in verse seven likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel talking about the wife as being heirs together of the grace of life help us of the grace of life inheriting together the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered the man is praying the husband is praying the wife will be a helpful support and do well to the husband and make the husband well prepared and ready to pray prevailing prayer you will not say as a wife i know when to torture him i know when to turn his mind away from the business of the day and i know when to disturb him is going to set a part time to pray and is praying on something that is on top of his heart at that time i will know how to hinder the prayer he wins some wife a virtuous wife will not do that you are supposed wives are supposed to be help meets for the husband in proverbs chapter 31 proverbs chapter 31 i read from verse 12 it says she will do him good do well and not evil all the days of her life she the virtuous woman she the virtuous wife will do him good how many days sisters i said how many days all the days of your life come back to verse 10 who can find a virtuous woman only those who pray who can find a virtuous wife only those who seek guidance from the lord who can find a virtuous woman only those who are not walking by sight who can find a virtuous woman for her price is above rubies the heart of her husband does simply trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil the man is not being extra careful be extra watchful because she knows she has a protecting wife she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life she seeketh wool and flax and walketh willingly with her hands hard walking wife she will not say well he is the breadwinner if he is not bringing money to the family and were to die of hunger let it be i'm not going to touch anything that's why i married him so that i can be lazy and not do anything no she seeketh wool and flask and walketh willingly with her hands she's like the merchant's ships 
She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night. That is, she rises up early in the morning and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Uh, that family seems to have maids that are serving them and she makes sure she provides for the husband, for the children, for the maids adequately at the appropriate time. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Sometimes there is space behind the house. And instead of having to go and buy this and buy this and buy that every time, she has a garden of vegetables at the back of the house. She's resourceful. She gathers her loins, verse 17, was strength and strengthens her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. She is selling something that is needed in the community. She is uh, so resourceful, she will find out what can I do to augment the resources of the family. A candle goes not out by night. Your candle will not go out by night. The winds of adversity will not put up the light of your family in Jesus' name. That verse is saying she supplies enough oil to the lamb so that the lamb is burning all the time. And the children wanting to wake up will not stumble over anything in darkness. Or the husband will not stumble over anything in darkness. Everything in the house is set in order. That's why it says a candle goeth not out by night. She lays her hand to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. What he's saying is, there are homes where the women, the wives, will know how to weave. They want to weave a cardigan, sweater, clothing, socks, whatever, for the little baby, for the children, even for the husband. They learn how to do some little, little things as a kind of labor of love for members of the family. She reaches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. If there are so many clothes, the family is no more using. The children have outgrown them, and the, the wife, the husband, uh, they have outgrown them. He looks for them, uh, and he gives them to the needy and to the poor. If there are books, the children have outgrown. They are no more you see those books. Instead of just piling them there, she is the one that is very thoughtful and caring. And then he looks at the people and looks at the families of other people that still have needs of all these things and he gives some to them she has the liberty in the family she's not like a slave that is uh, you know acting with fear and acting with uh, a kind of trepidation can I do it what will the man say what will the husband say no not at all there's such liberty and freedom in that family that whatever the wife needs to take to take care of other people, she does that without any fear. In fact, in verse 21, it says, she's not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her households are closed with scarlet. All the household, the husband is well dressed, the children are well dressed, and the children are well prepared for. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Uh, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. She beautifies the husband and she promotes and honors the husband. Her life is to be spent in making the husband respect and honored, respected and honored in the society. Her husband is known in the gates when he seated among the elders of the land. 
she make it find leaning and sells each and delivers girdles unto the merchant strength and honor at her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come sisters are you there sisters i said are you there if you are not married yet the choice of your marriage of the husband will make you rejoice in time to come if you are married already whatever has happened in the past and whatever water might have gone under the bridge from today your life will turn around your household conduct and character will turn around from today till tomorrow from this week till next week from next this month to next month from this year i'm talking to sisters to another year you will rejoice in time to come she opens her mouth with wisdom she doesn't just talk she doesn't just open the mouth she waits for the right time she waits to have the right word and when she opens her mouth she doesn't talk like a foolish person who has forgotten she is to build a family and she's tearing down with her words she opens her mouth with wisdom in her tongue is the law of kindness she looks well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness her children arise up and call her blessed your children will bless you when they grow older they'll bless you with the works of their hand and with provision for you when you come to old age in jesus name a husband also and he praises her many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all favor is deceitful and beauty is vain what that means is beauty physical beauty does not last a lady that looks very beautiful miss community is the miss or the mistress of the community the most beautiful in the community when she turns 40 things are changing she turns 55 things are changing she turns 70 things are changing and the beauty is not like it was when you were 25 years of age if you marry just because of that you'll be disappointed i pray you'll not be disappointed in your family beauty is vain but a woman that fears the lord she shall be praised give her the fruit of her hands and let her let her own works praise her in the gates helpful supportive doing well doing good unto the husband the inner beauty of a virtuous wife point number two now the internal but bone of a vibrant husband internal but born you see the husband must be able to stand straight and stand firm able to defend the wife protect the wife protect the children protect the family must be strong not a tyrant but strong to help strong to defend strong to uphold strong to encourage and such a husband must have backbone he doesn't expose that backbone just like we have backbone in our body and we don't tear our back open so people can see we have backbone 
we exhibit and demonstrate that backbone by what we do that we're able to stand erect that we're able to stand solid and stable when there is anything confronting the family that we don't run elter skelter internal backbone of a vibrant husband first peter chapter 3 verse 7 likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge you can do that and you're not feeling intimidated you're not feeling competitive you're not competing with your wife you are complimenting each other you dwell with them with the women with your wives according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife ah if i do that and i give honor to her she'll ride on me no not at all she'll respect you she'll take me for granted no not at all she will honor you you give honor to the wife and how do you honor the wife you take care of the wife and the way you speak to the wife looks like you're secured you see people who are not secured those are the people that easily get angry and they interpret everything the wife is doing to mean because she's working because she has a certificate because she has rich parents because she put part of the money down that we used to write in the house that's why she's behaving like this they misinterpret every action because they feel insecure a man with a backbone has a security and because of that security there is self-confidence and is able to give honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel and has been heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered your prayer will not be hindered brothers husbands your prayers will not be hindered now in Genesis chapter 20, the backbone. Genesis chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 7. Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. If thou, and if thou restore her not, Know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Thou and all that are thine. Abimelech was the backbone of the family. And if that backbone of the family took another person's wife, he is not the only one that will suffer, thou and all that are thine. When you have pain at your backbone, when you have disease in the backbone, you're not able to bend, you're not able to stand, you're helpless, even to yourself, and you cannot help another one. A person who has taken another man's wife, because this one is beautiful, if he's now to make restitution, and let the woman go so that the whole family can have peace. He has to be a man with a backbone. The backbone of conviction. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. That man had a backbone, internal backbone. Here is what the Lord has commanded. And whatever my kingdom will say, whatever my surrounding will say, whatever my community will say, I have backbone enough to carry out the word of God. Verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God and God healed 
Abimelech and his wife and his maid servants, and they bear children for the Lord at first closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. If any calamity has come on the family because of the action of the husband, and the Lord points it out now, like the message we're hearing, a man with backbone, a man with strength, inner strength, will not say, I will not do it now. I don't want my wife to say, uh-huh, because of the message we heard on that Sunday. That's why he's doing it now. Abimelech had backbone, and he did what he ought to do so that he will be able to carry the family forward in health. He was the backbone of the family. We're looking at Genesis chapter 25, verses 20 and 21. Genesis chapter 25, verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, and sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. That's a man with backbone. There was no child in the family. And this went on, and it's getting to 20 years now after they had married. And eventually, Isaac took hold of the horns of the altar and he personalized the problem. And he didn't say whether the husband or the problem was the, were with the wife or with the husband. That's not the problem. That, that's not a big deal. Whatever is the cause of that barrenness, Isaac acted as a man with solution. Somebody had been backbone. Isaac acted as a person that will turn the negative condition of the family around. That's a husband with backbone. You will have backbone. Every husband here, God will give you wisdom to solve the problems of the family in Jesus' name. You are no more trading blames and you are no more talking to each other. You are the cause of the problem and the cause of the problem. Let's leave all that alone. Let's have inner strength. You'll have inner strength. Inner backbone, inside internal backbone, you'll have it in Jesus' name. We're looking at Numbers chapter 30. We're looking at verse 8. Numbers chapter 30. I'm reading from verse 8. But if her husband disallowed her, on the day that he heard it, then he shall make a vow which she vowed, that which she uttered with her leaves, wherewith she bound her soul of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. Join that with verse 13. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul. Her husband may establish it, or her husband may make it void. That's the husband with backbone. The wife is making a vow, making a vow unto God. And the husband is not acting uninterested uninvolved. When that wife makes the vow and the husband hears it, the husband with a backbone will evaluate that vow in line with God's ordained precept and principle 
in the family. And if the husband with a backbone who is not seen, that's her. If I talk now, it can generate problem. I know this kind of commitment, this kind of vow will land her in trouble, health, challenge in the future. I will even affect the children, but what can I do? She's a woman of a strong mind. And once she makes up her mind to do anything, you cannot even question, you cannot correct. That man does not have a backbone. God said in the word that if your wife makes a vow, a commitment to God, of course, if you can affect and influence the vow to God, a commitment to her family, a commitment to a friend, a commitment in the place of work, and now you hear it, and you see that this commitment will not help her or help you or help the family. The word of God says, if the husband says no, that vow, that commitment will not stand. But only men with backbone will say anything contrary to the vow, to the commitment, to the consecration that the wife has made. In Jeremiah chapter 29, Jeremiah chapter 29, I read from verse 6. It says, Take ye wives and beget children, sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that she may be increased there and be not diminished. You will increase you will not diminish. I said you will increase, you will not diminish. The man, the husband, the father, that's always careful. The child is turning to 26, 27, 32, 33, 34, 35, and somebody comes to ask the hand, of the girl, of the lady, of the daughter in marriage. And she's always looking at their tribe, looking at their background, looking at their resources. And he's not allowing the daughter to pray. Always saying no, no, no. The marriage committee in the church, that's always saying no, no, no. That cannot be the will of God. While the other religious people are marrying four wives, five wives, seven wives, and they are bearing children, bearing children, and they are populating the whole nation. And while the other Christian denominations are releasing their daughters and uh, the ladies there to get married and get married, and they are overpopulating the, uh, uh, the nation. But this man without a backbone, the backbone of faith and the backbone of foresight is always saying no and the marriage committee is a kind of limiting the marriages limiting the marriages they are not working by faith what will happen is the church will die out when the older ones when they are old and old and they have gone and because we're not obeying the word of God we're so much afraid we don't have backbone and we cannot stand with our young sons and daughters eventually will be diminished your family will not be diminished our church will not be diminished Look at verse 6 again. Take wives. You're old enough. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. They're old enough to get married. And give daughters to your husbands. To husbands. Give your daughters to husbands. 
that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may increase and you may not be diminished. I said, you'll not be diminished. <laughs> and your sons and daughters who are married, and there's no a child yet, this day, the way is open. Yeah. Childbearing will start in your families in Jesus' name. Yeah. And you are fathers now, mothers now, very soon. Tell me, very soon. Tell me very soon you'll be grandfathers and grandmothers in Jesus' name. Verse 7, seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. Amen. We're coming now to First Timothy chapter 5, verse 7 and verse 8. The internal backbone of a vibrant husband. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 7. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You will not be an infidel. A husband with a backbone will always find ways to provide for the family legitimate ways but my brother if you are husband you're on this job and i see little difficulty there a little challenge there a little unpleasant thing on that job you quit i cannot talk that walk there again because it's affecting my personality it's affecting who i am they will not give me enough respect there. I quit. How are you going to provide for your family? I don't care about that. I quit that job. And then somebody helps you and you got another job. On that job, they have their principles of oppression. And you stay there again. You're not looking at the principles of oppression. You're looking at your personality. And somebody said something deliberately or maybe uh, unintentionally and then you say again i'm quitting i am leaving i cannot walk there again where are you going to walk you don't have backbone you're just running from here to there you see when you have backbone you'll think of your family you are the breadwinner you must bring something home you must educate your children and you are, you are going to bear a little difficulty if you have backbone. What if your child go to, uh, goes to school and a child comes back home, Daddy, I cannot go to that school again. Why? A teacher spoke to me like this. I cannot endure that. I cannot bear that. How are you going to do? What if your daughter comes back home when she's learning something and then comes back home? I cannot stay there because they spoke to me like this. There is challenge everywhere. There are difficulties everywhere. And we need a job. We need backbone to be able to stay there and provide for members of our family. You'll provide. If you have lost your job because of not having backbone, I pray for you, you'll get a good job in Jesus' name. And you stay there as a husband, as a man, as a breadwinner that has backbone. Because if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. You will not deny the faith. And it's worse than an infidel. 
you will not be like that in Jesus name Amen First Corinthians chapter 7 First Corinthians chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 2 First Corinthians chapter 7 Reading from verse 2 Nevertheless To avoid fornication Let every man Have his own wife And let every woman Have her own husband To avoid fornication Let every man Have his own wife As a married man You are backbone You've got a wife That's enough and you will not be looking here and there, a person that is looking here and there has forgotten why he got married. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Anybody married there? I said anybody married there? Where are they? God will bless your marriage. No impurity in your family. No fornication in your family. No heartbreak in your family in Jesus' name. But you'll be a man of self-respect. A man with a backbone. A person with a backbone is able to stand in front of his congregation. And he says like Samuel, whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Whose wife have I touched? Whose daughter have I touched? That man has backbone. I'm looking at people with backbone. And your backbone will remain strong in Jesus' name. And let me read that verse 2 again. Nevertheless, to avoid, tell me. But you know, there are some people that think it's not only I don't have problem of fornication and therefore I don't need to get married. Read the whole Bible. It's not good that the man will be alone. What does that mean? To avoid loneliness. Let every man have his own wife. To avoid insecurity. Let every man have his own wife to avoid backsliding. When your life is all alone and you have nobody to counsel you, nobody to relate with you, nobody to talk to you, to avoid backsliding, let every man have his own wife. You are reading in the newspapers, this one is depressed, that one is depressed, and that one committed suicide. Depression leads to suicide. To avoid depression, have somebody you can talk to, have somebody you are married to, have somebody you can relate with, and to avoid ultimate perdition. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Again, let me talk to the marriage committee. Somebody is already 60 years of age. She's a widow. And then she comes to the marriage committee and says, uh, I, I want to get married. And I'm feeling led to so-and-so, a widower. The widower is 63 and uh, the widow is 60 or whatever age. And, uh, you know, the marriage committee questioning, uh, are you being tempted at your age? Do you want to have children at your age? Are you, tem are you tempted to fornication at your age? Not really, but I feel lonely. Not really, but I feel all alone, insecure. And then to avoid insecurity, to avoid loneliness, to avoid depression, and to avoid backsliding ultimately. Let each man, every man, 
have the son wife and let every woman have her own husband is that all right i said is that all right if we have been guilty because we've been thinking this one way and we now need to balance up everything i pray that god will make us to act right in jesus name did anybody say amen yeah. our daughters our sons our youths did you say amen along with the rest of us the Lord will give you happy homes. The Lord will give you a, a backbone in your family. Your families will be better than the families of the past generation. We're coming to point number three now. The inside bank of a visionary home. The inside bank of a visionary home. A bank is where you make deposits and withdrawals. In the family, we make deposits. You see, while we're together, we make deposits of love. So that when we're separated by work or by travels, even though you are alone, you are able to withdraw from the deposits of love we made in the bank of our family faith we make deposits of faith while we're together you're putting in your faith i'm putting in my faith my comments are comments of faith my utterances are utterances of faith and we're making deposits so that when any problem happens and we don't have a local pastor to pray for us we can withdraw from the bank of faith where we're deposited we have hope and we're depositing hope anything that happens our language is the language of hope anything that happens our language is the language of encouragement we're making deposits and making deposits and when any calamity happens or any accident we draw out from the bank of hope that we have been depositing in the bank of joy joy we carry joy we exude joy we spread joy our atmosphere is filled with joy and we're not morose we're not uh, kind of uh, you know sad all the time there's joy 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 we deposit in our bank and then when there's any sin and you are all alone you can draw from that bank of joy we're giving support we deposit support and we give more than our children need we give more than our wives need we give more than our husbands need the deposit of support the deposit of a positive attitude positive attitude and so when your wife is away she can see your positive attitude on your face even when you are not physically there and when there is need she's drawing out of that bank of positive attitude intimacy and the joy that comes through intimacy you are together all the time when you are at home and you talk together you relate together and you do everything together that intimacy is a deposit in the bank in the home so that whenever there is uh, any physical distance between you she goes to draw from that internal bank inside bank in the home i pray that our home will have a bank that is overflowing surplus in Jesus name and then it's a visionary home having vision a desirable future helps us to make deposit we're investing in our future husband and wife they have vision for each other the wife has vision for the husband I have a vision for my husband to be strong, to be confident, to be bold, to be successful. I want my husband, I have a dream for my husband. 
he will live long and we're going to enjoy a fellowship together for a long time and the wife the husband has vision also for the wife and the parents have vision for the children and the children have vision for the parents the inside bank of a visionary home without vision let's look at proverbs chapter 29 proverbs chapter 29 we're reading from verse 18 proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 where there is no vision the people perish where there is no vision the people perish the people that don't look at the future and the vision they ought to have any little problem will scatter them any little problem will bring them down after all they have no vision they're even questioning why am i alive why am i in this family why am i eating how am i healthy what am i doing here because they don't have vision they perish they're easily overcome by difficulties and dangers i look at your family as you are here you'll have vision your family will not perish what kind of vision do we have number one vision for the household vision for the household we're reading from genesis chapter 15 I read from verse 1, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? That's his vision. He wanted a child. And at the slightest opportunity, he asked the Lord, and this still word of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold to me, thou wast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy bowels shall be thine heir. He had vision for the household. I'm going to ask you, what vision do you have for your household? Are you just living from day to day for yourself as the father of the family, for yourself as the mother in the family, for yourself as the father over the children? What vision do you have for your children? And how are you contributing to make that vision a reality? Number one, the vision for the household. Number two, the vision of hope. The vision of hope. Your family will not be hopeless. Your husband will not be hopeless. Your wife will not be hopeless. Our beloved, precious children will not be hopeless in Jesus' name. Vision of hope. In, in Romans chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 18, Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 18, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through belief, but he was strong in faith, 
giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform there will be a performance in your family number three a vision of health a vision of health your husband will not die young your wife will not die young your parents will not die young your children will not die young but you must have the vision the vision and you must do everything in line with that vision and if any member of the family is doing anything contrary to that vision of health you'll stand up you'll have a backbone you'll say my dear this is not right this will injure your health you have a vision of health acts chapter 27 Verse 34, Acts chapter 27, verse 34, Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, take breakfast, take your food. Don't go without having your breakfast because that does something to your metabolism, to your body. And so, anything that will contradict your health and you're eating haphazardly and you're eating junk and you're not eating balanced diet the vision we have for the family will not allow that wherefore i pray you to take some meat for this is for your health prevention is better than kill for there shall none she, there shall not an air fall from the head of any of you. I see you now. I see. I will see you again. You will remain strong. You will remain healthy, and you remain vibrant in Jesus' name. Number four: the vision of happiness. The vision of happiness. You must have that happiness in the family. And you must have, you must have the vision and contribute to that vision. You know, if you don't have the vision of happiness, you also make the home a desert. You make the family a desert. Whether the wife is happy or not, is not concerned. Whether the husband is happy or not, she is not concerned whether the children are happy or not. They are not concerned. You must have vision. And it's the vision of happiness. Proverbs chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 22. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. All that means says, if you understand what we call supplements, you eat and you take some medications, but this one is not that you are sick. It's called supplement, and you're taking it every time because it maintains your health and it supplies nutrients in the body that will not be there if you don't take them. A merry heart does good like a medicine. You're merry in your heart. You're happy in your heart. You have a vision that members of your family will light their candle from the source of your light and happiness will go through the whole body in Jesus' name. The vision of honor. The vision of honor. Honor your wife. Honor your husband. Have a vision. If you don't honor the man, who do you expect to honor him? If you downgrade him, if you trample on him, if you make him a nobody, 
in the place where he should have honor. When he goes outside, we cannot blame the outsiders if they don't honor him. Charity begins at home. I said charity begins at home. Honor begins at home. We're looking at First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Honor her. She's getting older. Honor her. She's not able to do what she had been doing 20, 25 years ago. Honor her. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. When your mother becomes old and weak and she cannot do for herself what she used to do for herself and for you, honor her. When your man becomes old and he cannot do what he used to do, honor him. And when it appears that they cannot produce like they were producing in the past, let's give honor to each other. The husband honoring the wife, the wife honoring the husband, the parents honoring the children, the children honoring the parents will honor each other and the honor will go around in Jesus' name. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and has been heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered your prayers will not be hindered the prayers you pray today will not be hindered the prayers you pray anytime every time will not be hindered in jesus name the vision of helpfulness the vision of helpfulness you're helpful to each other and you have that vision and you are asking and you're seeking what can i do today to be of help what can i do to my husband to be of help what can i do to my wife to be of help what can I do in the family to be of help? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and verse 10. For if the fall, verse 9, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if one, if they fall, the one will help up his fellow, but woe unto him that is alone. You see that? When he falleth, for he has not another to help him up. To help him up. This is the decision of the Lord that marriage is to, to provide help. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him, and help suitable for him. In verse 20, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. That's why God gave him Eve, God gave him a wife. Verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave father and mother, and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain, they shall become one flesh. Number one, a vision for the household. Number two, a vision of hope. 
Number three, a vision of health. Number four, a vision of happiness. Number five, a vision of honor. Number six, a vision of helpfulness. Number seven, a vision of holiness. A vision of holiness. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. First Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Our wives will not die in childbearing. Yeah. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. If they continue, they, husband and wife, if they continue, they, the man and his woman, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, vision of holiness, your presence in the family will make your family holier in Jesus' name. A safe child. A sanctified child, your presence in that family will make your parents holier, more sanctified in Jesus' name. The presence of the father in the family will make the wife and the children holier in Jesus' name. And the presence of the mother, the wife, will make the father and the children, the entire family, will make us holier in Jesus' name. She shall be saved in every situation. You will be saved in every situation. Insecurity will not catch up on you. There will be no accident in your family. There will be no accident of any type in the house, on the street, in the field, in the road, anywhere in Jesus' name. Like Abraham and Sarah came to a ripe old, old, old age, you will come to a ripe old age. Premature will be cancelled. Premature death will be cancelled. You will continue in faith, in charity, and holiness with sobriety. You must have vision of a brighter future. And that vision will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. He has revealed so much to us today about our family. The virtuous wife, the vibrant husband, and the visionary home. Open your mouth, talk to the Lord, and pray that all these will become a reality in your life and a reality in your family.